Okay, so today we are going back to the fall of the House of Usher. Today we're working on close reading. I'm going to start this video with just a review of how to use the controls on our online textbook, but the majority of this video will be filmed using the actual textbook. So I want to briefly remind you how to use the annotation tools here so that you are able to do this um, following along with us, even though you might be working online. So remember, we're going to open our textbook. You're going to select Interactive Student Edition. You won't see a lot of these other options at all. You're going to open it in a new window. And yesterday in class, I walked you through all of the beginning of the unit stuff. Today, we're just going to jump straight to Fall of the House of Usher to save time. So you can click on whole class learning right here, then click on Fall of the House of Usher. So just remember that this up top is the title, author and genre, background information, author information. If you want to hide this to have more space, you click this hide button that's up in the top. Remember that this is the playback. So as we are doing annotations, the way that you annotate or highlight is to click and drag the, over the text you want to highlight. You can pick the color. You can decide whether you want it to show up as a highlight, a circle, an underline. And you type your annotations right here in the box and click save and it will show up right there in the text. And you can go back and click this to get to the annotation again. So it'll hide it when you click away. And then when you click it again, there it is. If you decide, oh, I don't want that annotation anymore, you can click delete and that will remove it. And some of the margin questions we're gonna be talking about today from the textbook to find those, you go over here to making meaning, and then you will click close read the text. Uh, and this is going to walk you through uh, close reading. So this actually comes from one of the question pages in the book. So you're going to skip this first number one um, and just go down here to where it's giving you close read instructions for paragraph by paragraph. So this one is for paragraph one. You'll find paragraph one. The numbers are over here in the margins. You'll see right here. Um, and so this is paragraph one. You want to be reading this paragraph. <clears throat> and so then you'll look at the annotation instructions, mark words and phrases in paragraph one that refer to the imagination or altered reality. Um, the question, what is happening to the narrator as he looks at the house? And the conclusion, what is the effect of these strong descriptive details? And you can answer these questions, the question and conclusion part in the annotation or you could click notebook and type your answer here. Either one is fine. Um, and you will just scroll through the questions here. So everyone else will see these in the margins of their book. Yours, again, to get to that, you're gonna click on making meaning, close read the text, and then scroll down to this section right here. Okay, we're now going to switch over to working from the textbook. So just a reminder that if you're following along in the textbook, you're going to look for paragraph numbers. And I will try to give paragraph numbers as we go. You'll see them along the sides of the text. So you're going to want um, a highlighter, right? So I like to have a couple of colors. So I'm going to grab a few options here, right? And then you're going to want pen or pencil, whichever you're more comfortable with. Um, and you just want to have those on hand. You might also find it useful to have some sticky notes on hand because sometimes you need more space than what you have in the margins and the sticky notes help you to create more space in the textbook. Okay, so you should have read this yesterday and I'm not going to read it aloud to you today. Instead, we are going to focus our attention on specific paragraphs and I'm going to ask you to pause and actually do some of the work while we are here in class. So 
the first thing we want to look at is we want to look at paragraph one. And for paragraph one, we are looking at mood. Uh, you also, I forgot to mention this, you also want to have your writer's notebook nearby. And we are going to be working in the passage study section of the writer's notebook. So this is the one that looks like this. Yours is in black and white. Uh, and we're just going to turn to the first page um, of this section. And we're going to go ahead and title it so that we have uh, the page set up and ready to go. And then the, after that, we'll use the space on this page to focus on some specific skills. So um, some of our main focuses here are going to be on mood. Um, and then we're also going to look at sensory detail. And how those work together. OK, so. Just label the page and then you're going to set it aside. We'll come back to this when we are ready for it. Okay, so we're starting with looking at the first paragraph and looking for mood. So what I'd like you to do here is annotate details that describe the setting and how the narrator feels about that setting. So I'm going to use a yellow highlighter for that, right? And these are going to be setting details. I find it useful to color code and write down what color I'm using for everything because sometimes I forget from page to page what I'm doing. Um, and so I might switch colors throughout. Um, as long as you know what you're doing, it's fine. If you don't want to use multiple colors and just want to use one, you can do that. Just make sure you're labeling carefully. So right now we're looking at setting details. Um, so I'm going to point out a few of the details that tell us something about the setting and the narrator's feelings about it. And then I'm going to ask you to finish throughout the paragraph. So I would point out that it is a dull, dark, and soundless day. That's a setting detail, right? It tells us what the atmosphere is like. Um, and then I would also point out um, here... I know not how it was, but with the first glimpse of the building, a sense of insufferable gloom pervaded my spirit. So this tells us the narrator's attitude, right? And in fact, I should probably do that in a separate color. So we'll do narrator's attitude in red. So yellow, I've highlighted the setting details. Red, I'm highlighting the narrator's feelings. What I'm going to ask you to do is pause your video now and finish the paragraph. So you're highlighting one color for setting details and another character for narrator's feelings. If you only have one color, then you could also um, just mark each um, highlight with either an S for setting or an N for narrator, right? So if you don't have multiple colors, you can use abbreviations instead. So go ahead, pause your video and do this now. Okay, so now after you have finished reading through the paragraph, and remember that paragraph one continues on to the next page, you should have a fair bit highlighted in this paragraph. And so we've got some details related to the visual setting. And then also we have information about how the narrator feels as he looks at the setting. So then the next thing we want to think about is how do these details suggest the mood of the story? So um, what would be helpful here is to go back and read through some of the details you highlighted and then decide what the mood must be. So um, looking through these, we see words like dull, dark, and soundless, clouds hung oppressively, he's alone, the word dreary, which, dreary, which means um, depressing, shades of evening, so it's near nighttime, melancholy, which means sad, stern, desolate, which means uh, abandoned, uh, terrible, mere house, 
simple landscape, bleak walls. Bleak means dark and depressing. Vacant, I like windows. So everything up until up until the windows is kind of just sad and depressing, but the vacant eye like windows is where things get kind of creepy. Because if the windows look like eyes, then the eyes are watching you. Is the house watching you? But you could also think about um, why are the eyes vacant? It, are the eyes vacant because the person is depressed or they've lost something of themselves? And then if the house has vacant eyes, then what does that tell us about the house that our narrator is going to visit if the windows are described as having vacant eyes? And then we have white trunks of decayed trees, so decayed meaning dying and rotting. So what we want to do right now is we want to write over here. Now in the margin here, this is the next question, so I don't wanna use this space yet. Instead, I'm just gonna put it up here in the top. So let's talk about the mood so far. Based on all of those details is depressing, um, a little bit um, foreboding. Foreboding means expecting bad things to happen in the future, right? So our mood is depressing and foreboding based on the details in the text. And then the narrator, right, his reactions throughout, he feels a sense of insufferable gloom. Um, there's nothing pleasurable about it, so it's not even like enjoyable sadness. Um, he feels a depression of his soul. Uh, he compares it to being on opium right? The nightmares that come from like having a bad trip, um, a bitter lapse into everyday life, the hideous dropping off of the veil. This is a reference to the idea of like seeing beyond the grave. So like, um, maybe a glimpse into hell, um, iciness. So he feels cold, his heart sinks, his heart is sick. Um, he feels dreary. He is unnerved. Um, it feels mysterious, and he's having shadowy fancies, meaning like dark imaginations. And down here, he says it causes him to shudder. So the narrator, he feels depressed, chilled, and not chill, like relaxed, but chilled as in like frightened or concerned. Um, and then the word unnerved meaning he feels uncomfortable, right? He's, he's not entirely sure how he feels about things, but he's nervous, All right? And then the last thing we wanna look at, in what ways does this foreshadow or create a symbol? So the I like windows, I think foreshadow a dying house or family. Which goes along with the title, The Fall of the House of Usher. When we talk about house, we can mean a literal house like the building you live in, but sometimes when you talk about um, a house, you mean like a legacy or a family heritage. And so here with the title, The Fall of the House of Usher, we're thinking not just about what's happening to the physical house, but what's happening to the people who belong to that house as well. Okay, so then here we are on page 14, and we're gonna look at these close read questions. Anytime that you see these in the margin, it means there's something that you need to stop and do. So we've done red and yellow. I'm gonna switch to blue for this just to keep things separate, right? So annotate, mark words and phrases in paragraph one that refer to the imagination or altered reality. Um, and then I'm gonna grab a fourth color since this has another instruction here. Um, references to falling or sinking, right? So I'm gonna skim back through this section and I'm gonna look for uh, things related to imagination and altered reality. 
Uh, so for example, the altered reality might be, one example might be here on the first page. I know not how it was, but with the first glimpse of the building, a sense of insufferable gloom pervaded my spirit. So when he looks at it, he his reality or his emotions are altered. So I might look at um, this sentence right here. Okay, so that's an example of the altered reality. Um, and then an example of falling or sinking. Um, I might talk about this word hung oppressively low, right? So hung oppressively low in the heavens. Because if it's hanging low, then it's sinking, right? Or um, you might also look on this page for references to things that are falling down or leaning. So go ahead, pause your video now and finish annotating this paragraph, highlighting um, whatever colors you want to use for imagination or altered reality and falling or sinking. And again, if you've only got one color, you can abbreviate by using I for imagination or F for falling. Okay, so after you have annotated for these items, the next thing you want to do is look at the question. What is happening to the narrator as he looks at the house? And we've already talked about this up um, above, so if you've already answered that, you can just draw an arrow to it. And then the next thing, what is the effect of these strong descriptive details? So we'll just answer that right here below. And we say death and decay because we've got references to the dead trees that are rotting. Okay, so that's what we do um, to annotate here. And again, um, you want to just follow the instructions. You can color code. It doesn't have to look pretty. Um, at one point, I had to switch to a darker color since I was I had overlapping things, which is totally fine. Um, easy enough to do that on the online textbook as well. So now we're on page 16. And we are looking at paragraph number six, right? Paragraph six, and I'll just outline that so it's a little darker to see. And we are looking at the sentence that begins, while the objects around me, right? So this is one really long sentence. Um, and so here we're looking at a reading strategy, right? So this, this is the description of the reading strategy. The first thing we want to do is break the sentence into parts using punctuation to help us figure out um, where to break the sentence. And then we are going to figure out what's the main idea of the sentence and then what are all of the extra details. And here we're talking about, this is called a compound complex sentence, which means that it has um, two complete thoughts plus a lot of incomplete thoughts attached to it. So first, let's just look for all of the punctuation. And I'm just gonna highlight, using yellow here, I'm gonna highlight all of the punctuation that I see. Okay, and then here's the period at the end, and I drew these lines to show where the sentence ended. So I've highlighted the punctuation, and what I wanna do now is I want to look at the words between each set of punctuation and decide is it the main idea or is it a an irrelevant or an extra idea. So I'm going to use, um, we use yellow for punctuation, we will use blue for our main idea and then we will use red for our details.
So let's read through. While the object's around me, it doesn't express a complete thought, so I know it's not the main idea. Let's keep going. While the carvings of the floors, right, that's not a main idea. We'll keep going. Or, sorry, the carvings of the ceilings. The somber tapestries of the walls, that by itself is not a complete thought. The ebon blackness of the floors, not a complete thought. And the phantasmagoric armorial trophies, which rattled as I strode. Okay, so that's not a complete idea. It does have a verb in it, so that means we're getting closer to the action, but this is not the main idea. Were matters, were but matters to which, right, so that by itself makes no sense, or to such as which, makes no sense by itself, I had been accustomed from my infancy. Okay, so if we look at this just by itself, I had been accustomed from my infancy. This expresses a complete thought. Even though it doesn't fully make sense without all the extra details, it does at least hint at the main idea. So to be accustomed to something means to be used to it. And here when he says infancy, he means childhood. So this is familiar from childhood. Now, let's keep going. While I hesitated not to acknowledge how familiar was all this, I still wondered to find how unfamiliar were the fancies which ordinary images were stirring up. So this is another main idea, right? So our unidea our our two main ideas in this sentence is that the actual surroundings are familiar from his childhood but they feel unfamiliar. So having that in mind, then we want to look at what the rest of this sentence is. So in this first part of the sentence, he is listing things, right? Objects around me. And when we use hyphens like this, this is called an M dash. Um, an M dash just means it's two of the hyphens um, side by side, and they come in pairs usually, right? You see there's another one down here. The M dash is used to separate out and create a middle section. So this one actually, um, there's three of them together. So these two work in as a pair. This one is working to introduce a list. So this one works the same way that you might use a colon. Right, and let's zoom in on that so you can see what I'm doing here. So this one functions the same way as a colon, which is what we're used to using to start a list. This one is replacing commas or parentheses. So, <clears throat> so objects around me, that's what he introduces, and then he starts the list, right? And the things around him include carvings, tapestries, so he's talking about ceilings, walls, blackness of the floors, um, the trophies on the wall that rattle, right? And then he gets to his main main point as part of this list. Where it matters to which or to such as which I had been accustomed from my infancy. So he's saying he is used to seeing the decorations of the ceilings, the walls, and the floors, and all the trophies. This is familiar. Then he goes on and we see another M dash and he says, while I hesitated not to acknowledge how familiar was all this and here in the middle, this is just an aside, meaning it's adding extra information. But if you took it out of the sentence, it would not hurt the sentence to leave. But when we're looking at this, we can kind of skim past that. And then we get here. And the way that we know that this is an important part of the sentence is we have a verb, right? Wondered. Um, and then had been accustomed, right? That's a verb phrase, and this is a verb. And so these verbs help us locate the most important parts of the sentence. And then in this last part, I still wondered to find how unfamiliar were the fancies. Fancies here means imaginations, right? Which ordinary images were stirring up. So the things he was used to seeing were making him imagine unfamiliar things.
So this is how we break down a long, complicated sentence. We start by looking at all of the punctuation, breaking the sentence into its parts, then we look for the verbs to find the main ideas, and then we just figure out how all the extra stuff relates to these main ideas. Okay, now we're moving on to page 17, and so we've got a close read question here, and this one is about paragraph 8. Paragraph 8 starts at the bottom of page 16 and continues through the top of the next page. Remember that it doesn't become a new paragraph just because we have a page break. Um, it, we don't actually start a new paragraph until it's indented, right? So let's look at what it wants us to do. Mark details in paragraph eight that relate to the absence of color and force. So let's pick a color for this annotation. We'll go back to yellow. So we're going to highlight absence of color and force, right? So force here we can also think of as meaning strength. So go ahead and pause your video and highlight anything in the video that suggests an absence of color or strength. Um, the word wan, which means pale, uh, cadaverousness, meaning being like a dead body. Um, so he's got the complexion of a dead body. He has liquid and luminous eyes, meaning that they seem almost see-through. His lips are thin and pallid. Pallid's another word for pale. Want of moral energy here, which represents um, another type of strength that he's lacking. His hair has web-like softness, so we're comparing his hair to cobwebs, which are very weak um, and also colorless. Ghastly pallor, so ghastly, again, has to do with um, death. Um, and then pallor, which is a word for complexion that has to do specifically with the way the complexion of dead bodies. So we have that re-emphasis of dead body here. Um, the miraculous luster of the eye. So again, we've got the shininess of the eye. Um, and then gossamer, which if we look at our footnotes, is a type of fabric that is delicate and light like a cobweb. So another comparison to cobwebs. And the hair floats rather than falls because it has no weight left to it. So this all represents a lack of strength and force. So then we look at the question, what portrait of Usher do these details create? So what can we conclude about him based on um, the descriptions? And you can put this in your own words. You don't have to say it the exact same way that I do. If the word corpse is unfamiliar to you, maybe you write dead body instead, right? Use the words that are most familiar to you so that your notes are helpful to you. And the next part we want to look at, conclude, what does this portrayal of Usher help the reader understand? So something bad has happened to this man. All right, so now we're moving on. We're going to look at the top of page 18, and this is in paragraph 10. We're looking at this sentence that starts some of these, as he detailed them, interested and bewildered me. So we are going to um, look specifically here at the semicolons, and we are going to look at how they are being used. So this is just a study in semicolon as punctuation. And you might want to take a moment to make a note in your writer's notebook here that we're focusing on semicolons. <clears throat> I 
and we are looking at how semicolons are used in the sentence. So first, let's identify the semicolon. And when we talk about semicolons, we mean this symbol. It's the dot over the comma, right? And it has a very specific function. This is special punctuation. If you know how to use a semicolon properly, you get major brownie points with college professors. All right, so first we're going to identify all of our semicolons in the sentence. And I'm going to go back to yellow for identifying punctuation. So we found all of our semicolons, and it might be helpful just for understanding this if we also identify commas. So I'm going to switch colors for the commas. So we see we actually have more semicolons than commas in these two sentences. <clears throat> so the main thing that we want to do is we want to see how is the semicolon being used in this sentence, right? So look at what comes before the semicolon and what comes after it in this first sentence. So before the semicolon, some of these, as he detailed them, interested and bewildered me. By itself, that is a complete thought. So we could put a period here instead, right? We don't have to use a semicolon. We could put a period here. But the semicolon then leads into the next part of the sentence. Although, comma, perhaps, comma, the terms in the general manner of the narration had their way. So this part of the sentence does not stand by itself because if you start the sentence with although, it means it has to be attached to something else. So this semicolon is connecting the complete thought at the beginning of the sentence with the incomplete but almost complete thought on the second half of the sentence. So this is part one and part two of the sentence. Um, complete thought starts here. Incomplete thought starts here, and it needs to be linked to something else. So if you start a sentence with although, or if you start part of a sentence with although, it means that you have to link back to something else because you're talking about a contradiction. So it's linking an independent thought with a dependent thought. Right, so that's the first way that we see semicolons used here. We're going to see a second way that they're used in the next sentence. So let's look at the next sentence. <clears throat> so again, we're going to look at each section of the sentence up until the semicolon by itself. He suffered much from a morbid acuteness of the senses. Stop. That's a complete thought all by itself. So we'll just highlight the first part of that sentence in blue to say it's complete thought. Okay, the most insipid food was alone endurable. Again, complete thought. He could wear only garments of certain texture. Complete thought. The odors of all flowers were oppressive. The complete thought. His eyes were tortured by even a faint light. Another complete thought. And there were but peculiar sounds and these from stringed instruments which did not inspire him with horror. Another complete thought. But we have this word here that's doing something important. We have and. And is what we call a coordinating conjunction, which means that it links things that have equal value. So I'm just going to make a side note over here. So that means that if you are listing items, then all of the items have to be just single items. If you are listing um, dependent clauses, then the and can only link dependent clauses. Independent clauses have to be linked to independent clauses with the word and. So you cannot use an independent and a dependent clause and link them with the word and. It just doesn't work. Right, you can do it, but it sounds crazy. 
um, and that's what we call an error of parallelism. So and creates parallelism. The things that are being linked have equal value. They're similar in structure. So what we see here is a list of independent clauses being linked with semicolons. Now, why use the semicolon instead of the comma? Technically, you could use commas here because you have a coordinating conjunction. But you see that we also have commas throughout the sentence um, outside of, or within each independent clause. And so then things get complicated because you have commas and like commas separating the sentence and commas uh, creating dependent clauses, and that gets too confusing. So instead, we can use an independent clause, or we can use, I'm sorry, a semicolon to link the independent clauses and leave the commas for the dependent clauses. So then it creates a hierarchy of independent and dependent clauses. Now, why would you do this instead of just separating it and using periods? Because you could use periods, right? You could just make these all separate sentences, lots of really short little sentences. But think about how you read when you see a period and a capital letter versus how you read when there's no period and no capital letter. If you were to break this up into a bunch of really short sentences, how would you read it? you might read it in a really choppy way. A lot of short sentences sometimes sounds aggressive, whereas linking them all together makes it sound like all of these things are, or reminds us that all of these things relate to just one person, which helps to emphasize here that this man is suffering a lot because all of these symptoms belong to him. So it connects the ideas and it slows the pace of the reader. So these are the ways that we uh, can use semicolons when we are uh, writing a long sentence. So we can use it to connect a complete thought with an incomplete thought, or we can use it to connect a lot of complete thoughts to slow down the reading pace and to connect the ideas to make it clear that they're all related to each other. So this is an example and an explanation of how we use semicolons. And this, because this is in the passage study section of our notebook, right, now we know that if we want to go back and see an example of semicolons being used, we just have to go to paragraph 10 of Follow the House of Usher. And I'll go ahead and add a page number just to make that easier. It's textbook page 18. So I know where to find this information again if I want it. So here we see another close read in the margins. It wants you to annotate in the first two sentences of paragraph 13. So we're looking at paragraph 13. That is right here. This is on page 19 of your textbook. If you're on the online, find paragraph 13 in text. And it's asking us to mark sections that are set off by dashes or parentheses. So we are looking for dashes and we are looking for parentheses. <clears throat> and we're only looking at the first two sentences. So let's go ahead and pause and identify the dashes or parentheses. So you should have marked the dashes in one color and the parentheses in another. And now it's asking you to look at what's in between those. So let's just go ahead and underline what's in between each section. So Okay, so this is another thing I want you to add to the passage study section of your text or of your writer's notebook because this is another grammar strategy that you can use in your own writing. So let's talk about M dashes and parentheses. So M dashes are the long dashes, parentheses, we know what those are, right? So we're going to look here at how they are being used and what they do in the sentence. 
<clears throat> Why does the author structure these sentences in these ways? What do these fragmented sentences suggest about the way Usher speaks and behaves? So let's first just read the sentence and we, I'm going to read the dashes, meaning I'm going to pause and announce the dashes when we get to them. He admitted, however, although with hesitation, that much of the peculiar gloom which thus afflicted him could be traced to a more natural and far palpable origin, dash, to the severe and long-continued illness, dash, indeed to the evidently approaching dissolution, dash, of a tenderly beloved sister, dash, sole companion for long years, his last and only relative on earth. So the same strategy we used before, we're going to look for our verbs, right? He's, we start with the verb admitted, however, although with hesitation that much of the peculiar, peculiar gloom which thus afflicted him, that's another verb, could be traced to a more natural and far more palpable origin, and all of this, the rest of this is just detail, right? So he is admitting something. He is being afflicted, and means he's suffering. So he's admitting that the reason he's suffering can be traced or can be linked to. And then he's going to describe exactly what it is. To a far more natural, a more natural and far more palpable origin. Dash. What comes after the dash here names or explains the origin of Usher's suffering. Right? So that's what the first break does. To the severe and long-continued illness, indeed to the evidently approaching dissolution, right? So this gives more specific than the previous phrase. Right? So here the word dissolution means the ending or downfall of a tenderly beloved sister. So to the severe and long continued illness of a tenderly beloved sister. So what does this tell us? His sister is sick. His sole companion for long years, his last and only relative on earth. So this last part that comes after the end dash uh, tells us why it is so particularly sad that his sister is dying. And it's because she's the only family he has left. Right? So the end dashes introduce extra information that adds to the intensity of the sentence, but it's not information that you have to have to understand the sentence. So in our writer's notebook, we're going to talk here about M dashes, and we are again in paragraph 13. Right? You can understand the sentence if you ignore everything in between the end dashes and you would still have an idea of what's going on, but the end dashes are going to add extra information for us. Right? And then the next thing we want to look at is the pair or the parentheses, which we see in the next section or in the next sentence. So again, we'll do the same thing. We're going to identify what's going on in these parentheses. So we'll start at the beginning of the sentence. Quote, her decease, he said, with a bitterness which I can never forget, would leave him, parentheses, him, the hopeless and the frail, the last of the ancient race of the ushers. While he spoke the Lady Madeline, parentheses, for that, for so she was called, parentheses, passed slowly through a remote portion of the apartment and without having noticed my presence, disappeared. So, in the first sentence here, her decease, he said, with bitterness which I can never forget would leave him, him the hopeless and the frail. So this adds more information about Usher. And then here, in the next sentence, while he spoke, the Lady Madeline, for so she was called, this just tells us her name. 
which is extra information. We probably could have inferred that Madeline was the lady who walked through just from context, but here the narrator specifically or specifies that her name is Madeline. So parentheses, Essentially, it does the same thing that the M dash is doing. So we see that these two are working the same way. So sometimes when you come across M dashes, just think of them the same way that you would think of parentheses. They work the same way, but not always. Sometimes M dashes do other things. M dashes can function as commas. They can function as semicolons. They have a lot of other options as well. Okay, so now that we have annotated uh, for this paragraph, we want to answer the question and draw a conclusion. So the question is, why does the author structure these sentences this way? Um, so what kind of effect is, is created by adding all of these extra asides and information that interrupts the flow of the thought? We can also think about what kind of detail is being added here. So we see the detail, um, he says, you know, there's a good reason for him seeming depressed. And then it goes on to say uh, the reason that he's depressed is that his sister is very ill. In fact, she's probably going to die very soon. And then we hear him speak out loud. Um, and when he talks about himself, he calls himself hopeless and frail. So he actually comes across as a little bit dramatic. Right, his emotions are more intense than if he just said it in a straightforward way. If, you know, if it just said um, he was depressed because his sister was sick and got straight to the point, you wouldn't have all of these intensifiers that's talking about um, him thinking about losing her and being alone and the only one left on her. So then the last question, what do these fragmented sentences suggest about the way Usher speaks and behaves? Right, because he is struggling to stay on topic and to get to the point. He has lots of asides and um, rabbit trails in his speaking and so all of this suggests that his thoughts seem, are sort of jumbled up and that he's having a hard time focusing but also that he's emotionally kind of dramatic. We're going to go ahead and look at paragraph 19 which is on page 21. It's the start of this poem. Um, this is a poem that was written by Roderick Usher uh, that he performs for the narrator. So we want to think about what kind of details are being provided about the haunted palace and then we want to think about what those might suggest about the meaning um, or the theme and then what purpose the author had for including them. So first we're going to start by highlighting details about the haunted palace that are described in the song. So in the first stanza, we see green valleys, um, tenanted is a word that means lives in. So in the greenest of our valleys, in a place where good angels dwell, right? So basically heaven, right? It's a heavenly place. Once a fair and stately palace, so fair here meaning beautiful, stately uh, meaning regal, radiant meaning bright, reared its head, uh, and here it's being compared in like almost in the same way that you would compare like a great beast or a dragon, something that rears its head, raises its head um, in an aggressive and kind of commanding way. 
In the monarch thought's dominion it stood there, never seraph spread a pinion over fabric half so fair. So seraph is another word for a type of angel. So uh, no angel has ever spread wings over a place half as fair as the place where the haunted palace lies. So this really is leaning more into that heaven idea. So it's like it's better than heaven. Okay, so then I'm going to encourage you to pause the video now and continue looking in the remaining stanzas for details about the haunted palace. Okay, so you'll see I have finished highlighting details through the text. Um, and at stanza five, I actually switched to red because here's where I see a tone change, right? We go from descriptors of beautiful music and good weather and royalty to a claim of evil coming uh, and then sorrow to assail something is to attack it. Um, and then uh, essentially the story here is that the king of the beautiful palace has died. And then in the last stanza, we see and travelers now within that valley through the red lit in the window. So red lit means uh, red lighted windows. So if we've got red light, it makes us think of the idea of hell or fire. Um, a discordant melody, discordant means out of tune or ugly, um, ghastly river, um, ghastly here means blood, so a river of blood through the pale door, a hideous throng rush out forever and laugh but smile no more. So it's laughter without a smile, so it's not happy laughter, which is kind of creepy, right? And so we see in the beginning everything is good and beautiful, and then at the end, things have turned dark and evil. So what we want to consider here is what is uh, the character of Roderick Usher expressing about his life and his family based on this information. So in the past, things were good, golden, beautiful. And then in the present, things are evil, dark, gloomy, or ugly. So he is thinking about and contrasting the good old days to what's going on now. And then we can think about how is this symbolic? So we might ask ourselves that question, what does this symbolize about Roderick's family? So the Usher family is dying out, right? Um, the world is no longer good for them. Um, it also suggests this idea that nothing good stays good forever, right? All good things eventually come to an end. And so here we've got someone who comes from this very privileged and beautiful and regal line, and we see them descending into death and decay and being obsessed with the past, um, but the present is terrible for them. And so we see this as a symbol of the family dying out um, and losing some of their power and prominence that they are used to having. Right, so this is an example of how an author can use a story as a symbol. And when we talk about symbolic stories, the word for that is an allegory. Right, so a symbol is just one thing that stands for something else. But if the, if the symbol is a whole story, then the word for that is allegory. Um, and some famous examples of allegory include uh, The Wizard of Oz, which is an allegory for the political um, movement of populism. Uh, you could talk about Animal Farm, in which the author 
uh, writes a story about farm farm animals, but actually he is talking about communism. Um, and then more modernly, you can even look at the Hunger Games as an allegory for um, the media and like a criticism of capitalism. So you can see several stories in which the whole story becomes a symbol for um, some big abstract concept and we call that an allegory. So this poem is an example of an allegory. Okay, now we're on page 22 and we're looking at paragraph 25, right? So this is 25 and here we want to annotate characterization of Usher and the narrator's opinion of him. Um, so we will do characterization in red and we will do the narrator's opinion in blue. So pause the video now and I want you to identify characterization and just for just as a definition characterization is descriptions of the character so things that tell us what the character is like. Okay, so this uh, paragraph is actually kind of challenging to work through because it doesn't directly state a whole lot of information. A lot of this is having to draw inferences. So I am going to walk you through some of my thinking on this and then I encourage you to add other ideas that you may have noticed that I missed. Um, and just because I've read this before does not mean that I know everything about it. In fact, students often point out things to me that I don't see the first time. So let's look at um, this word pertinacity, which means determined stubbornness. So we see that he has this opinion that he holds and expresses very stubbornly. So we see stubbornness in him. Right? And so that is an example of his character that when he believes something, he is unwilling to change his mind. This opinion in its general form was that of the sentience of all vegetable things, but in his disordered fancy, so disordered here actually is a comment um, from the narrator. So here it's suggesting that he's not in his right mind. Right. Um, the idea had assumed a more daring character and trespassed under certain conditions upon the kingdom of inorganization. So essentially, um, he believes that even stones and inanimate objects have um, thoughts and souls. Uh, the narrator goes on to say, I lack words to express the full extent or the earnest abandon of his persuasion. The belief, however, was connected, as I previously hinted, with the gray stones of the home of his forefathers. So the narrator here comments that um, Usher is influenced by his physical surroundings. So then it goes on to describe the reasons that Usher believes that the stones around him have um, like thoughts and spirits. And then he goes on here to talk about um, the water of the lake. He says, it's evidence, the evidence of the sentience was to be seen, he said. And the narrator adds, and here I started as he spoke. So started here means startled. So the narrator is startled by what Usher is saying. So it was to be seen, he said, in the gradual yet certain condensation of an atmosphere of their own about the waters and the walls. The result was discoverable, he added, in that silent yet importunate and terrible influence which for centuries had molded the destinies of his family. So importunate means unfortunate.
um, and terrible influence. So basically, he thinks his family, his family's downfall has been like caused by something outside of his family. Now, based on this belief, we can make some judgments and some inferences about him. So he believes that his family going from being rich and powerful to um, dying out slowly and losing their power in the world is caused by some kind of evil outside of his family. Um, he doesn't see it as something caused by their own actions or their relationships. And we're going to see um, throughout the rest of this story, there are some specific behaviors and attitudes that his family has as a custom, like as their heritage, that actually do contribute to their downfall. But he sees it as something caused by something outside of, of himself. And so it's almost like he cannot take responsibility for the mistakes of himself and his ancestors. He instead needs to blame it on the world. And then the narrator says, such opinions need no comment and I will make none. So the narrator basically just says, I'm not going to tell you what I think about that, which means we can infer um, what he really thinks. If he, you know, what does he truly think if he thinks no one needs to say what they think about that because we all agree. Um, it suggests that the narrator probably thinks it's crazy. So here we see something about how the narrator is reacting to uh, Usher, and we also get some insight into Usher's mental state. So he's, he's kind of losing his mind, and the narrator here admits that and emphasizes it. We'll draw your attention to remind you that, um, so here he talks about books, um, and we can make some judgments and inferences about the family based on the types of books that they have. They have these very, um, like old books that are written in foreign languages. Um, something else to keep in mind is that books were really, really expensive up until the late 1900s. And so for someone to have a library was actually a sign of wealth um, in most earlier generations. So um, a single book could cost, you know, 10, 20, 30 dollars, which doesn't sound like a whole lot of money to us. But if you think about the difference in currency then versus now it's it's pretty steep you know it, it could cost a week or a month's worth of wages to buy one book um and they have tons of these books and they're all really old and rare so this is a representation of how much money they have right books are expensive so this is an example of money um, and then he goes on he talks about here um that one night Usher says that the lady Madeline was no more, essentially that his sister has died. And then he states his intention of preserving her corpse for a fortnight uh, in one of the vaults. So a fortnight means two weeks, right? So he wants to keep his sister's body for two weeks before he buries it. Um, and here the narrator suggests that um, he, that the near, that Usher might actually be wrong about his sister, that maybe she's not actually dead. Um, but he kind of goes along and he doesn't feel like it's his place to argue with Usher about it. So he just says, you know, assuming that his friend would not lie about his sister being dead. And then it continues on to, and describes the method of burying her. So we're going to go on to page 24, and we're looking here at paragraph 30, right? So mark the words that relate to physical actions and behavior. So again, we've got a longer paragraph, so we want to look at specific physical actions and behaviors.
Okay. So here I have looked specifically at um, descriptions of Usher roaming from room to room. Um, his voice shakes when he speaks as if he's afraid. He spends time staring off into space for hours. Um, he seems to be listening to an imaginary sound. And then we shift to a different type of action and behavior. The narrator becomes terrified and feels infected by his terror so that he himself begins to give in to Usher's superstitions. Now, there are some clues in here that we can start looking at um, to see what this shows us about his mental state and emotions, right? So he is wandering around, um, objectless, meaning he, there's no point to what he's doing. He's just kind of wandering around pointlessly, but he's moving very quickly and his steps are uneven. So that suggests that he is restless. We also see he, that his voice shakes, so he is terrified. We see that he stares off into space, so he seems distracted. He's hearing things. Right, things that are imaginary. And then all of this leads to uh, the narrator himself feeling kind of crazy too. So all of this suggests that he is um, going insane. Um, or we could think that maybe he is literally being haunted or that this is just grief. Right. So what is the effect of these descriptive details? It all leads us to question Usher's sanity, right? Now, and why is it important that we're questioning Usher's sanity? Because Usher's the one who told us his sister is dead, right? But now he's standing there staring off the space, listening for a noise that no one else can hear. And previously, um, previously the narrator describes him as a hypochondriac a hypochondriac being a person who thinks that they are sick even when they are not. Um, and so this clue, plus the fact that um, we're now having to question his sanity, and we build in the fact here that the narrator has never seen the body of the dead sister, right? It's already in the coffin. So the narrator helps to carry the coffin, but he doesn't actually see the body. Um, and so there are these clues being built in that start to suggest that things are not as they seem. You can also check out some clues here in paragraph 29, right? If we want to look at clues about the sister. Right, so we could see so they open up the coffin to look at her, right? And at first, the narrator thinks they look alike. Um, and apparently they've been twins. But they don't look at the dead for long because they cannot look at her for very long. Um, it, they find themselves awed by her. So she is, she is left looking actually very beautiful, right? So there's blush upon the bosom and the face so her face is still has a blush about it um, and there's a smile on her lip um, and so these details suggest that um, well it suggests one or two one of two things right so there was an illness uh, called consumption which today we refer to as tuberculosis which left its victims looking beautiful, right? So they would have, they would die with rosy cheeks and like a blush about their lips, which was actually caused by um, ruptured blood vessels from intense coughing. 
Um, so this was a really common illness during this time. And so this description might suggest that she died of tuberculosis, which was a, um, that was the kind of illness that did kill people at this time. It was not something people recovered from. Um, today we have ways of treating it back then. They didn't really have a good way of treating it. And so this did kill most people, but it could also suggest that she might be alive, right? Um, they don't get close enough to check for breath or a pulse, and they didn't have modern medical knowledge that would do a really good job of explaining or letting them verify this sort of thing. And so the, this description could mean she died of tuberculosis, or it could mean she's just in a coma. Um, and so we don't know. Right. But now the person who told us that she's dead is Usher and Usher seems crazy. So suddenly we have to start questioning what we believe to be true. On a previous page, we took his word for it that she was dead. And now we're not sure if we can trust him. So this is what we call an unreliable narrator. Right. So an unreliable narr narrator is used in uh horror genres and suspense genres um to create sus suspense because if the person telling you the story is not someone you can trust to tell you the truth then suddenly there's this uncertainty in the reader of what is or is not true and so when we take the word of a character who is not reliable we suddenly have to question and there's the suspense because you know you're going to find out in the end whether it was true or not. And so we see here the use of the unreliable narrator in that the narrator has chosen to believe Usher, who he knows is crazy and is also starting to go crazy himself. Okay. All right, so the next passage we're going to look at is passage 31 and i want us to start right here with i endeavor to believe that much and what we're specifically going to focus on here is the use of personification and again we're putting this back in our passage study section of our notebook so let's write this down So let's look at the personification in the passage. We're just going to look through paragraph 31 and identify personification. So let's do personification in blue. First, he says, sleep came not near my couch. So sleep stayed away from him or avoided him. And then he talks about here, the, the draperies were tortured into motion by the breath of a rising tempest. They swayed fitfully to and fro upon the walls and rustled uneasily about the decorations. So here, this description of the draperies being tortured, right? Um, and then that they're swaying fitfully and rustling uneasily. So this idea that the movement of the draperies shows the emotion of the draperies. And draperies here means curtains. And so it's just describing the ways that the curtains are being moved. And then here, this word tortured is important, right? Um, think about what being tortured or the idea of tortured creates as far as the tone Right, so think about how that impacts the tone. Okay, so then the next thing we want to look at in this uh, paragraph is we want to look at setting details. So again, what do we know about the setting? Um, it is seventh or eighth day after placing her in the dungeon, which that's a weird spelling of dungeon, but that's what he means. Um, so it's, she's been dead for a 
dead for about a week. And then we also have information about the gloomy furniture, dark and tattered draperies that are swaying fitfully. Um, and then we continue to see um, other details about the intense darkness of the chamber. Um, and then he's hearing low and indefinite sounds which came through the storm, so it's also storming, and he doesn't know where they're coming from. So this is what we know about the setting. We know that it's night, it's storming, and he's hearing noises and it's very dark. And in the middle of all of this, we see this description of the curtains. And so the personification in this passage actually creates the setting detail. So And then we want to think about how it impacts the mood, right? So describing the curtains as restless and tortured creates a darker mood. And then it creates suspense. And then when you add this to the fact um, that there is a storm, darkness, and unexplained noises. Now, we want to think about this is, you know, about a week after the lady has been put in the dungeon and they think she's dead, but all of a sudden it's dark, it's stormy, he's hearing weird noises, he doesn't know what's going on, and this is building suspense to the climax of the story. Right. Now, um, what I would like you to do is stop the video in just a moment, and I'm going to ask you to try in your passage study section of your notebook, write a description of a scary, tense, or eerie setting using sensory details and personification to enhance the mood. So you can just go right below this, right, you can put try it. Um, and some possible options you can think about a haunted house or a graveyard or really any scary situation you could think of um, pick from movies or books or um, just whatever you would personally see as scary or suspenseful and i want you to write it using sensory detail and personification I also would encourage you to try using some of the punctuation skills that we've talked about up here. So what you're doing now is you are trying the skills that we've written about on this page in just one paragraph. So pause your video now and take a few minutes to write a setting description that is using personification and sensory detail to create suspense and that uses one of these punctuation skills. Okay, so I'm going to ask you guys to actually submit your sample paragraph on Canvas. So just hold on to that, set it aside for now, but you're going to come back to it and you're going to submit what you wrote on Canvas for me to read. <clears throat> Moving on to look at page 27. We're looking at paragraph 34 for those of you following along online. And in this, it wants us to mark words and phrases that suggest extremes, right? Whether of emotion, action, or size. So any kind of extreme version of whatever's being talked about. So for example, in the first sentence, the impetuous fury 
right? Impetuous and fury are both really strong words. Impetuous means like defiant or impulsive. And fury is extreme anger, right? So we might just make a note. So the gust of wind is extremely angry. So go ahead and pause the video now and find the rest of your extremes in this paragraph. Okay, so this is what I have identified in this paragraph. Um, we have the impetuous fury of, this, of the wind that lifted them from their feet. So the wind was so strong it almost blew them off their feet. Um, wildly singular, here the word singular means out of the ordinary or unique, right? So like very, very different. So wildly singular in its terror and its beauty. So the night is the most terrifying and beautiful night that he has ever seen. Um, here we talk about violent alterations in the direction of the wind. So violent suggests extreme, and then alterations meaning change, so extreme changes in the wind's direction. Exceeding means especially or intense density of the clouds. The clouds hung, hang so low that they are pressing upon the turrets of the house, so the clouds seem heavy. Um, Lifelike velocity, velocity has to do with speed. Um, and then this word here, careering, it doesn't actually have anything to do with the word career as we think about it, like with jobs, but it's a word that means moving wildly. Right, so um, you might hear it used to say like the cart went careering around the track, almost tipping over. Um, it's that idea that moving in a very wild and out of control kind of way. No glimpse of the moon or stars, so it's dark. Um, huge masses of agitated vapor, so again, this is an extreme in size. Um, and then agitated meaning um, moving quickly or um, very restless. So the question, what is noteworthy about this storm? Um, and so we can talk about the storm is unusually violent. So there's light, there's no light coming from lightning or anything like that. There are really heavy clouds and high winds, um, almost like a tornado or a hurricane. What greater meaning do these details give to the storm? So um, everything is out of control, right? Nature is out of control. which can symbolize that things have gotten out of hand. It can also symbolize the power of nature and the ways in which humans cannot avoid death or decay no matter how much we want to. Um, so that could be another thing we can look at. So then he goes on, um, and convinces Usher to close up the tomb or cl close the blinds. Let's um, let's go back to bed. I'll read to you. We're just we'll wait out the storm. Everything's gonna be fine. Um, trying to sort of convince himself that nothing is really wrong. And he's reading aloud, um, and he has just gotten to the part of the story where the hero is. Uh, has reached a crucial decision, and he's reading aloud, and then he gets interrupted as he's reading by a strange noise. But he tries to ignore it, and he keeps reading, and he keeps reading, um, and he keeps hearing things, but he tries to ignore it. And so here in this section, we're alternating, right, and so these are paragraphs 38 through uh, 44. alternates between telling the heroic story, which is approaching its climax, and describing 
strange noises and disturbances, the narrator wants to ignore. So it's kind of like one of those things where he hears a noise and he starts reading a little louder and then he hears another noise and he starts reading a little faster and he's trying so hard to keep his mind off of it and convince himself everything is fine and he continues reading and he continues reading um, but the longer he goes the crazier it feels to him and then we see we come to paragraph 46 Right. So um, he eventually pauses um, in the reading because Usher begins to speak. Right. And so 46 is where he starts speaking. So we're going to look for repeated words in paragraph 46. And we'll do that with yellow as well. So at this point, if you have looked for repetition, you've seen repetition of the word hear uh, and the past tense of it, which is heard throughout. Um, you've also seen the word many repeated several times. Um, the phrase, I dared not, and he says that several times, I dared not, I dared not, I dared not speak, I dared not speak. Um, and then we have this repeated structure of um, will she not be here and on? Is she not hurrying? Have I not heard her footsteps? So that reference of not, and then the emphasis of she and her, and then finally the repetition of the word madman. So why do these words merit being repeated? Merit means like what's the value of it? So the repetition, we want to think about what the effect of these words is. The repetition emphasizes Usher's horror at the truth. We also emphasize here, not hear it, yes, I hear it and have heard it long, 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 many minutes, many hours, many days have I heard it, yet I dared not, oh, pity me, miserable wretch that I am, I dared not, I dared not speak. We have put her living in the tomb, that I not that my senses were acute, I now tell you that I heard her first feeble movements in a hollow coffin. I heard them many, many days ago, yet I dared not, I dared not speak. And so by repeating, I heard it long ago, many minutes, we know that Usher has known she was alive for days and he did nothing. Right. He figured out days ago that he had buried his sister alive and he knew she was still alive because he could hear her, but he did not speak up. And so this this creates the horror of the situation. Right. And then the fact that um, he knows that he left her there makes it even more scary, this idea that she is coming. Because how would she feel? How would anyone feel if their brother locked them in a coffin, right? So he is afraid of her and what she will do. So the effect of these repeated words is that it emphasizes the horror of the situation. It creates fear. Okay, and this paragraph, the way it ends is actually fantastic because after he does all of this repetition, madman, here he sprang furiously to his feet and shrieked out his syllables as if in the effort he were going to give up his soul. Madman, I tell you that she now stands without the door. And we have to ask, who is the madman? Is it Usher or is it the narrator? Why didn't Usher go and free his sister? Was he afraid that the narrator would think he was crazy? Um, was it because the narrator kept telling him that he was hearing things that it wasn't real? 
Um, or is the madman Usher? Or maybe it's both. But when he starts yelling madman, to whom is he speaking? But he now believes she's going to stand without the door, meaning she's standing just outside of the door. And then we have our last two paragraphs, which we will I will read aloud um, so that we can discuss the conclusion. As if in the superhuman energy of his utterance there had been found the potency of a spell, the huge antique panels to which the speaker pointed threw slowly back upon the instant their ponderous and ebony jaws. It was the work of the rushing gust, but then without those doors there did stand the lofty and enshrouded figure of the Lady Madeline of Usher. There was blood upon her white robes and the evidence of some bitter struggle upon every portion of her emaciated frame. For a moment she remained trembling and reeling to and fro upon the threshold. Then with a low moaning cry fell heavily inward upon the person of her brother and in her violent and now final death agonies bore him to the floor a corpse and a victim to the terrors he had anticipated. So the door swings open, and there is standing Lady Madeline. And she's covered in blood, and she is emaciated because she's been starving for a week in the coffin. Um, and she falls forward against her brother, and she drops dead, and he drops dead of fear. So she dies of having been locked in a coffin, and he dies of his fear when she reappears. From that chamber and from that mansion, I fled aghast, so he runs away. The storm was still abroad in all its wrath as I found myself crossing the old causeway. Suddenly there shot along the path a wild light, and I turned to see whence a gleam so unusual could have issued, for the vast house and its shadows were alone behind me. The radiance was that of the full setting and blood red moon, which now shone vividly through that once barely discernible fissure of which I have before spoken as extending from the roof of the building in a zigzag direction to the base. While I gazed, this fissure rapidly widened. There came a fierce breath of the whirlwind. The entire orb of the satellite burst at once upon my sight. My brain reeled as I saw the mighty walls rushing asunder. There was a long, tumultuous shouting sound like the voice of a thousand waters, and the deep and dank tarn at my feet closed sullenly and silently over the fragments of the house of Usher. So in the end, the narrator runs in terror from the house, and when he gets farther away down the path, he hears a crash, and he turns and looks, and the house has crumbled into pieces and fallen into the lake. And that is the fall of the house of Usher. So the last thing I want us to think about here is the conclusion, right? So we just reread paragraph 48. Um, what kind of closure is offered in this story? Is it resolved? And is that resolution positive or negative? Does everything turn out all right in the end or not? Um, and then how does it compare to the ways that other horror or suspenseful movies and stories tend to conclude? So think about that. And then what I'd like you to do in your day book is I would like you to think about how you might write the ending differently. So in this ending, um, the lady is standing outside the door. Both Madeline and Roderick Usher die in the same moment. The narrator runs away and the house collapses into the lake. What else would be an appropriate ending for this story? So I'd like you to take some time and jot down some ideas of how it might end um, and maybe write it out with some sensory detail and explain why you think that might be an appropriate ending for this story. So that is the end of this lesson. Um, tomorrow in class we're going to talk about some of the analysis questions um, and we will go through how to do these and we'll discuss your answers and what you noticed and what questions you have from this process. So if you had any questions, if anything was unclear, I encourage you to take some time and write down those questions to ask in class tomorrow.